Hey guys, welcome back to the Nightfall Q&A. Sorry it's been gone so long, but I think other content took a little bit more of a priority. In this week's q and I'm going to be answering some general questions that you guys have had over the past week or so, and we'll start with the Red Bull campaign, and so the question is, unsurprisingly, Dado, what do you think of the Red Bull exclusive mission and the Red Bull campaign? Well, first of all, I don't think it could have been possibly revealed at a worse time. With the pricing fiasco of the Taken King and the collector's items, I think that whole thing just hit harder than it would have if revealed at a different time or if the drama of the situation wasn't as thick. For those of you who don't know, Red Bull has partnered with Sony or Activision or whoever where you can buy a specially marked can of Red Bull, punch in a code into redbullquest.com, and you'll gain access to an exclusive mission when the Taken King comes out. You'll also get a consumable that boosts your XP gains by 50% for 30 minutes. July 1st, so today actually, is when you can start getting the consumable, and September 15th is when you get access to the mission. Now within this exclusivity is even more exclusivity, which I find funny. In July, supposedly you can only get the cans of Red Bull with these codes at 7-Eleven, and then in August, they get sold in more places. If you are outside of the United States, you're going to find it pretty difficult to get your hands on a code. I'm not sure what the situation is with Red Bull in general outside of the United States. However, this mission will become available to everyone for free on January 1st, 2016, so you're paying for earlier access for the mission. Worst case scenario, you ignore literally everything I just said, and just wait a little while, and you can play the mission. Oh boy. Um, it, it's just, it's weird to me. Destiny is the most not MLG Red Bull Mountain Dew Doritos game as far as mainstream games go. I think the whole thing is ridiculous. Not ridiculous good, not ridiculous bad, just ridiculous. Obviously, they wouldn't have made this deal happen if they didn't think it would be lucrative or profitable. That's what businesses choose to do. Uh, do things that are going to make them money. For people outside of the United States who may want in, yeah, you have a right to be bummed, absolutely. And I think that if stuff like this is going to happen, that at least it at least should be available to everyone. But I'm sure there's going to be plenty of codes being flung around by the community. I think we're venturing into slightly dangerous territory with regards to the XP bonuses. That does give an advantage to some people, they can level a little bit faster. At the same time, it's only 30 minutes, but yeah, you know, when do we cross the line? I get it. On one hand, yeah, if you want to play it early, you gotta go buy a Red Bull, you're paying more. On the other hand, how many of you are already drinking Red Bull? How many people are going to buy something at Starbucks every day? You know, it just... It, it came at a bad time. Was something like this really needed? Of course not. Is the mission gonna contain an item that's really good? I have no clue. I, I doubt it. But, just, yeah, uh, a sigh of a mixture of apathy and disappointment from me, I guess. Next question is going to have a bit of a shorter answer. Hey, Dado, what's up with the 347 Vesta Dynasty and the Fate of All Fools exotic scout rifles? Are they in the game? Short answer, no. Long answer, no. Luke Smith said in an interview recently at E3 that both of these weapons do not exist in the House of Wolves. They were only discovered because of data mining, and data mining tends to find stuff that may or may not exist. For example, Trials of Osiris was data mined as early as September, perhaps even earlier, and I, it didn't actually make it to the game until House of Wolves. There's been plenty of stuff that's been data mined that never made it to the game. It's just the risk you run when you trust all data mined information. Not everything that's data mined is guaranteed to be in the game. Will we see those weapons eventually? Who knows? But one thing's for certain, they are not in the House of Wolves. Next question. Disregarding all of the drama with the Collector's Edition items coming with the Taken King, I am just worried about the $40 price tag of the expansion itself. All the other expansions have been $20. I don't know if I want to buy it. Well, I can tell you that the Taken King is more expensive because it's going to add more than the other expansions have added when they came out. I'm not going to justify the price just yet because we don't know exactly how much is coming with the Taken King, but I know it's going to be more than what we've been getting. But if you're still really that worried about the Taken King and don't want to buy it or don't want to pre-order it, then I just have one thing to say to you. Don't pre-order it. Seriously, don't. This should not be a revelation to anyone at this point. Bungie absolutely does not have the benefit of the doubt right now. They don't. So if you're worried about the game, you're worried about the expansion, you're worried about 
if it's going to be worth buying, then do not pre-order and wait for reviews to come out. Wait for people to talk about it. No one is forcing you to buy the expansion. Just wait. Just to branch off that, a lot of people have expressed concern about international pricing, how it's basically much more expensive outside of the United States, and yeah, that sucks. That is a global issue, though, that's not just with Destiny. That definitely needs to be looked at in terms of a global scale. I know I would be pissed if I had to pay more. That absolutely, absolutely should be addressed in some form. Something that I haven't talked about in a while, we have this question. Did you play The Division at E3? How was it? Any updates? Yeah, I got to play thanks to RX Gaming, who you guys should totally go check out. His link in the, is in the description. But yeah, I got to play, and it was fun to play and all, but all we got to play was PvP in one of the Dark Zones. Uh, that's what the PvP zones in the Division are called. I'm much more interested in the RPG systems and the PvE side of things and the investment behind the game, and I didn't really get to see too much of that in action. Basically, when you go into a Dark Zone, there's some loot that you can go grab, and you, you know, you have to kill these much more powerful enemies to go get it. But sometimes the loot is contaminated, so you need to extract it, which is a pretty lengthy process. You can also encounter other players while extracting the loot, and they can choose to attack you, or you can attack them, or neither of you don't attack each other, you don't have to attack each other. But if you're attacked, you need to protect your loot and your extraction. It's much more tactical, it's much more, well, it is cover-based, uh, you need communication, and I definitely enjoyed what I got to play. It was fun. But it was just PvP, similar to Destiny, so I need a little bit more than that before I can cast any further judgments on the game. I think those were all the big E3 Taken King related questions, so let's move on to some more general stuff. Next question. Why is the Vault of Glass still difficult at level 34 with an experienced group, but Crota's End has gotten so easy? I'd say the reason is because they're very, very different raids and are designed very differently. Vault of Glass is still the most tightly tuned experience in the game right now. The fact that many of the phases last a long time makes dying a much bigger deal as opposed to Crota's End where dying isn't as big of a deal and can occasionally even help you go faster looking at the bridge encounter. Deaths don't matter in Crota's End as much because of the nature of the encounters. You can do the whole place solo, it doesn't make the place harder, whereas dying in Vault of Glass, even one death can be a big problem, mainly with Templar and its long stages. You have someone die during Atheon, that means only two people are outside to open portals and kill supplicants. You have someone die during Oracles on Templar, they're harder to get to and you have less damage on Hobgoblin snipers. You have someone die on Crota? Whatever. You kill the ogres maybe a few seconds slower. Crota's shield goes down in 1.2 seconds instead of 1 second. Death has much less of a meaning and much less of an impact. There's not that significant penalty in Crota's End. In Vault of Glass, even one death can be brutal and just start that chain reaction of everyone else dying. Next question. Destiny players hate Thorn two-shot kills and final round sniper. However, in CSGO, the AWP is a one-shot shot sniper to the body, the M4 is a two-shot to the head, and the AK is one both when armor is bought, but its competitive CSGO players are fine with this. Is this because the two games condition players differently? I would say that's absolutely the case. CSGO and Destiny are two vastly different games played in a much different manner. Different guns, physics, rules, etc. We've just come to expect a certain type of scenario with Destiny as CS players expect a certain type of scenario with CSGO. I play Call of Duty and Battlefield knowing that I should expect a certain pace of play. With Destiny, the pace of play doesn't include being one-shot by snipers to the body. Headshots, yeah, obviously that's a one-shot, but if people are in a sniper duel, they both know that they have to go to the head to get a one-shot. When one person has to go for the head and the other can hit anywhere, it changes the pace of play, which is something that bothers a lot of people. Next question. With Taken King having the biggest raid yet, do you think Bungie will sell the G-Horn to help? And if so, should they make it cost more coins like 50 to 100? I very much doubt it, um, and I no, I don't think they should sell it. Um, the G-Horn is not supposed to be some tag-along component that everyone needs to complete a raid. It's a weapon just like every other weapon in the game, and it's a weapon that needs to be toned down. So something like this question isn't something people are asking. When we live in a Destiny world where something like this is being asked, something just needs to be done about the weapon. And to extend on that, should the G-Horn be sold? Well, if Bungie wants to destroy any semblance of strategy there already isn't in the game, then yeah, they should have Xur sell it, otherwise I don't think they should have him sell it. 
This is not a jab at people who don't have it, and I've seen people suggest that Xur should sell G-Horn because they've played so many hours and they still don't have it. I think Xur should sell G-Horn because my RNG sucks is a terrible reason to have Xur sell it. The option that makes the weapons much more expensive, say something like 150 to 200 coins, seems like it could be an interesting idea for those veterans who have all those coins but are missing, you know, one or two items to finish their exotic collection, but I just don't know how much it would impact the game, so I don't really feel comfortable commenting any further on that. Next question. Sometimes you say stuff like kite in a direction. What does kite mean? Kiting is where you grab the attention of the enemy and continue to pull it into your direction, sort of like actually flying a kite. The kite is the enemy and you're holding it in the air, but you bring it with you when you move around. So you're trying to keep the enemy focused on you, but move it to a different position for whatever reason. So if someone says kite the boss over here, that means everyone should move to a new location in order to drag the boss over to the new position that they want the boss to be in. Next question, how much does exposure increase your shields? And if you don't know, what's your best educated guess? Does it also affect your health? Last, do you think it's an overall advantage or disadvantage? Well, first off, it does not affect your health. Uh, that last one third of your health bar, you will regen health normally under the effect effects of exposure. I don't know exactly how much it increases your shields. My guess would be that it's maybe five to seven times more, but I'm not 100% sure. I think it starts as, as an advantage, but then as you get more and more hurt, you're basically down to your health bar, which is about half health. So you have to do the rest of the encounter with only 50% of your normal health. It does force you to play a little more cautiously though, which means maybe you won't put yourself in danger as much as you normally would, resulting in less deaths. Next question, what do you do when you get frustrated or angry? I noticed that in your streams, you usually take a short break after doing a stupid. Is that all? I'm asking because I am bad at dealing with anger and I'm curious about your insight. Well, I can get pretty salty at times, but generally when I load up a stream, I know that I can't get too angry, otherwise it'll just make me look like a jerk and I'm enough of a jerk already according to the internet, so I don't need any more of that. If I'm off stream, I just stop playing and I just go do something else. It's the absolute best way to just drop all that negative energy instantly. Streaming has done a pretty good job of enabling me to suppress my anger, knowing that I can't get angry, otherwise that'll just, you know, bother people. It, do it doesn't look good on a stream. That's all you can really do though. Just take a little breather, take some time, get over it and move on to the next game or just shut it off and give yourself some time off. That's the best way to just get rid of all that negative energy. Final question, regarding the question I asked about adding more classes, do you think Destiny 2 shouldn't have PvP so they can focus on PvE content without having to worry about balanced PvP? As fun as PvP can be, this would help Destiny and there is already lots of other PvP games out there already. Absolutely not. I don't think saying, well, we can't get them balanced, so let's just throw out PvP is gonna make, that's not gonna make anyone happy at all. Overall, the Crucible is pretty balanced. There are definitely outliers right now, and obviously the lag is a little bit of an issue, but for a, for a game like Destiny, which has a very wide variety of weapons and skills, it does pretty well. You know, we still need to tweak some things, but I think that would be an absolute detriment to the game, just throwing out PvP. I think that's a very, very cop-out style of uh, of doing things. So before we go, I just wanted to thank all of you guys and gals for tuning in this month. I don't think I've worked as hard as I have in June to bring you guys good content. I think it's some of the best content that I've been able to make over such a period. You know, very, very consistently kind of good. Um, June was my most viewed month of all time, even beating out last September. So it, 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 that's awesome. You know, I saw a big bump in subscribers, more than my normal rates of growth. So welcome to all of you new people, guys and gals. I'm glad that you decided to come by the channel, and I hope the videos have been uh, pretty good. To those of you who have stuck around all this time, it is very, very, very much appreciated. I will say that I know I'm absolutely going to burn out if I continue at the rate that I've been going, so if you see a slowdown in content, especially now that a lot of the House of Wolves content I've really wanted to discuss has put into has been put into video form, um, don't, don't be too surprised, because I, I need to slow down or I'm just going to completely burn out so anyway enough of that thank you guys very very much for watching hope you enjoyed the q a and i'll see you guys next time